Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're finishing up chapter seven with a section on sampling distributions for sample means. Our learning objectives for this section are find the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution, this time of sample means. We're going to need to check the 10% condition again before calculating the standard deviation. That is the rule that we followed in section two with the sampling distribution of sample proportions and that we learned about in chapter six. We're also going to explain how the shape of the sampling distribution of a sample mean is affected by the shape of the population distribution and the sample size. This is what we will call the central limit theorem and you'll see when we get to that in class how that works. We also want to be able to calculate probabilities when our sampling distributions do follow the normal condition, which we're going to be checking for also. We know our big interest in sampling distributions, in this case of X bar, the sample means, is that we wanna be able to make inferences about the population using a sample. So we see on the left a graph that's household earnings in thousands of dollars, and we can see where the mu or the population mean is. When we create the sampling distribution, remember what we've done is we've taken repeated samples of the same size from our population and we've graphed all of the sample statistics. And then we're able to see the distribution of all of the sample statistics, in this case, the sample means. What do we notice about the difference between the graph on the left and the graph of the sampling distribution on the right? First of all, we see that on the left, we've got a very right skewed distribution. It is unimodal and, on, and, and it, is, it does have a very wide range and we don't know what the standard deviation is because it's not given to us, but we know that it does have a large spread. When we look at the sampling distribution on the right hand side of the of the sample means we can see how very narrow that distribution is compared to the population we also see a complete change in the shape of the distribution it it looks like it could be bell shaped we definitely see it's approximately symmetric and we see a very small spread just want to note that the sample size for the sampling distribution, again, the graph on the right hand side, is sample size of 100. When we choose many simple random samples from a population, we're going to end up with the sampling distribution when we graph the sample means. Remember that that center of the sample mean or the mean of all of the sample means on the sampling distribution is going to be centered at the population mean and it's gonna be much narrower distribution than the population distribution is. So what is the connection? We can say that mu sub X bar, or the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means is equal to mu, the mean of the population. We can also say, knowing that the standard deviation is going to be much narrower on the sampling distribution than what it is on the population distribution, that sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. So it's affected, the, the spread of the sampling distribution is affected by the size of the sample. And that's as long as we follow that 10% condition, which means that we can use that formula for the standard deviation. And these facts about the mean and standard deviation of X bar are true no matter what the shape of the population started out being. And this is really, really powerful because as we saw in that original set of graphs we were looking at just a minute ago, regardless of what the parent population looked like, as we take repeated samples, as long as the sample size is sufficiently large, we're really gonna have a very narrow distribution and it's not gonna look like the parent population anymore. sampling from a normal population. If we're already starting out with a normal population that we are sampling from, then the sampling distribution is also going to be shaped with like a normal distribution. So it's the, in general, our sampling distributions 
are going to look like their parent population unless the sample size is sufficiently large. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to look exactly like the parent population, but they will be similarly shaped. So we're going to go from right skewed to right skewed or left skewed to left skewed unless the sample size gets larger and larger. But if we already started out at normal, then it's going to just continue to be a normal distribution in the sampling distribution. This means that if we started out with a normally distributed population with a specific mean and standard deviation, the sampling distribution of the sample means is going to have the same center as the population and the standard deviation is going to have the relationship sigma, which is the population standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size as long as we've met that condition where the sample size is no larger than 10% of the population size. This is where the real power comes in to sampling distributions, the central limit theorem. Now remember, when we're talking about sample means, we're strictly talking about quantitative data, numerical data only. When we were talking about categorical data back in section 7.2, we were dealing with sample proportions and population proportions, but now we're talking about means, so keep that in mind. We know that most population distributions are not normal. Salaries, housing prices, etc. So what is the shape of the sampling distribution going to be for sample means when the population isn't normal, the one that we're starting out with. Well, it's a remarkable fact that as sample size increases, the distribution of sample means changes shape. It looks less and less like the original parent population and more and more like a normal distribution. And when the sample size is sufficiently large, then the distribution of sample means, the sampling distribution, is going to look very close to normal, regardless of what the original population proportion started out as. So the central limit theorem says that when n is large, and we're going to talk about what large means in a minute, the sampling distribution of the sample means is approximately normal. So let's see what the central limit theorem says. I want you to take a look at this very strangely shaped population distribution in the diagram. You can see there are huge gaps. We've got a bunch of data on the right, a bunch of data on the left, and some data kind of sort of in the middle. It's got a huge range. It goes from 0 to 32, and we have varying frequencies. So if you were to describe the shape of the sampling distribution and as n increases, what would you say? This is n equals 2. So this is a sampling distribution of sample means when the sample size is equal to 2. And you can see that we're starting to fill up some of those gaps. It still goes from 0 to 32. You can see the frequency is lower because it's more spread out amongst the values. It doesn't really look much narrower yet, but it is narrower because you can see the frequency at the extremes is much lower than the original population distribution. Now, when we have n equals 5, the shape difference is dramatic. It's starting to look bell-shaped. It's much narrower. We see very low frequencies in those tails at the left and on the right. When we go to n equals 10, you can see that even the range has changed dramatically, and we're starting to see that beautiful bell shape that we love. Once we get to n equals 25, we're super narrow and still bell shaped, which means we're going to be able to probably use normal procedures. Just notice that in all of these, however, the center stays the same. So in each of these sampling distributions, we still are mimicking that population mean. This might look like math magic, but it's really not. What's happening is as we take a larger and larger sample size, remember we're finding the mean of that sample. So we're finding the mean of any particular sample, increasing sizes of sample, and then we're graphing all of the sample means. So the larger the sample, 
the mean is going to go more towards the center. The mean of the sample, I should say, is going to go more towards the center. So that's going to push the distribution of the sampling of the sample means, the sampling distribution of the sample means towards the center, towards that population mean. And that's what's going to make it narrower and narrower and narrower. So the central limit theorem says that even when the population distribution is very non-normal, like that weird example we just saw on the last slide, the sampling distribution of the sample mean looks approximately normal, even with sample sizes as small as 25. However, we're not going to use 25 as our rule of thumb. We're going to have a condition that we'll be checking so that we can use normal procedures, and our rule of thumb is going to be we want a sample size of 30 or greater to say that our sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal. This means that because of the central limit theorem, we can use normal procedures to answer questions regarding probability about sample means even when the original population distribution was not normal because our sample size is sufficiently large. Just a quick recap, the sampling distribution of X bar is when we take repeated samples, really the every single possible sample of a particular sample size from a population, the center of the distribution, the sampling distribution that is, is going to be the same center, the same mean as the population. The connection between the standard deviations is going to be much narrower in the sampling distribution of the sample means by dividing by the square root of the sample size. So as the sample size increases, we get narrower and narrower in the sampling distribution spread. And the central limit theorem gives us a rule of thumb of 30. So if our sample size is 30 or larger, regardless of what the shape of the population originally was, we can use normal procedures. Now, what that means is if we don't meet that large counts or normal condition of at least 30, we cannot use normal procedures. So pause the video if you need to review the objectives. We've hit them all, and now it's time to start problem solving. Remember to ask questions in class if you need any help with any of the problems. See you in class.